Steve, you may like to wipe care of them. No. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to sign the birthday card. Oh, no, we didn't. He signed it. I yeah. signed it. Oh, right. We might know him later. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be good. Morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? <clears throat> Father, we come before the throne this morning with heavy and yet overflowing hearts. We, uh, we come with humble hearts. And we are so grateful for this time that we are back in the church house. Um, you're the sovereign God that we serve and you hold us uh, in the hollow of your hand in a position which we do not earn nor do we deserve. You continuously pour blessings and provisions and mercies out on us. Again, these are things that we don't deserve and we don't earn. As we gather here this morning, Father, we, we pray your blessings on all the families that are here with us this morning and those that are not here for whatever the reasons. We pray that this time spent together would be to your honor and to your glory. And as we look at the portion of your inerrant word that we will study this morning, it might be a source of challenge and blessing for us. We know without a doubt that these are perilous times. But uh, you're still in total control. And because of who and what you are, we will continue to grow in grace and in the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name, his powerful, matchless name, that we pray and give thanks. And all of us together say, Amen. 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 You want to <laughs> tickle the ivories? Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And is a discerner, judge of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God might be fully equipped unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Let's open God's word this morning to Acts. Acts chapter 2, the Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 2. Feels like we haven't been here in, in the church house for years. And uh, I'm just glad that we are here. I'm grateful to our sovereign God that we are back in the church as it were. And I'm not sure what the outcome of all of this is going to be, but I'm sure that once everything settles down and, uh, and we understand and realize that our sovereign God is in total control, so whatever transpires, all of it will be to his honor and to his glory. <clears throat> Richard and Carolyn, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, it's good to have you. Now, by way of review, if you will, just uh, we are in Acts chapter 2. We're talking about Pentecost. And the word itself means 50. And It looks at the 50-day period from the time of the resurrection. There are 50 days within that time span until <clears throat> after the ascension. Uh, well, it, it's actually the uh, 40 days 
from the time of the resurrection to the time of the ascension. And then as we read in, in uh, chapter 14 of John, the apostles were told to go back to Jerusalem and to wait for the coming of the Spirit. They were told that uh, actually it says until you receive power. And the Greek word there is dunamis. And it means power. In other words, God was telling them that uh, as he said in the 14th chapter of John, he would not leave them as offense, but that uh, the comfort would come. Well, where we are in the second chapter of Acts, we see that the, the coming of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, actually the, the uh, infancy stage or birth of the church, the body of Christ. So that's, that's what we're looking at this morning. Uh, last time we were together, we were on the, the Zoom, and uh, so we were together electronically. I, I'd much rather have us here, eyeball to eyeball, but that, that's, that, that's a whole different ball of wax, and I'm grateful for that. Um, we were looking at, at what actually transpired. There were... Uh, the apostles had gone back to Jerusalem, and they were gathered there, and uh, there were several other individuals with them, a total crowd of approximately 120 individuals, according to Scripture. Um, they were the 12, the, the apostles, I think, were the, <coughs> excuse me, they were gathered and it says that they were gathered in the house. Well, I guess it really doesn't matter whether they were gathered in the house, in the temple, outside, but what actually is important is what transpired. Why were they in Jerusalem to begin with? Well, it was festival, feast time. The, the feast of Pentecost, as it became to be known, is actually the feast of weeks. You had uh, the Passover, the unleavened bread, and you had the, the uh, first fruits. Well, this was the fourth one. These were annual festivals, and any male child between the ages of 12 and beyond was mandated to be in Jerusalem to celebrate these four festivals. So that's why they were all gathered there uh, in Jerusalem. And, of course, the Lord, at the point of the ascension, had told them, go back to Jerusalem and to uh, uh, Judea and Samaria. And while we're talking about Judea and Samaria, uh, these areas are erroneously known as the West Bank. Well, they're not really the West Bank. They are Samaria and Judea, uh, an absolute solid part of Israel. So I, I give you that, so you keep that in mind. No extra charge, just a little added history. Uh, um, so um, the twelve, they were gathered wherever they were gathered. Let, let's just between we covered the last time we were together. There are forty-seven verses in this second chapter, and we covered the first thirteen. So before we go into to verses. 14, say, to about 22. I just want to do a little reviewing. Let's start at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place, in that one place. <clears throat> and it says, Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. What do we have here? Well, we have a noise, we have a rushing wind, we have a violent rushing wind, we have 
Verse 1 tells us that they were gathered together in one place. Verse 2 says that they were gathered in the house. So where were they gathered? Somewhere in that vicinity. That's basically all we need to know. Um, and then what happened? Well, there appeared to them tongues as a fire <clears throat> distrib distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them. Now there's a couple of things I want to tell you about this, these tongues. These tongues were actually uh, languages, understandable languages. And at this particular time, these flames of fire can and are attributable to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so what was actually happening, and bear in mind that Christ had told them, go back to Jerusalem until you receive the power. Well, this is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit normally prior to this would come upon uh, someone on a specific occasion. At this particular time, under these particular circumstances, the Holy Spirit was descending <clears throat> on individuals. And uh, as we go through this, you'll see that the individuals that were indwelled by this were believers. These were the 12 apostles plus everyone else that was in that crowd that was a believer in Lord Jesus Christ. So, look at verse 4, if you will. And they, all, and they were all filled with the, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Spirit gave them power. <clears throat> Verse 5, now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. The nations that we will mention are the nations in and around the Mediterranean Sea. So it says under heaven. Well, uh, that's the particular area that they're talking about, right around the Mediterranean. So, And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together. And they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in their, in his own language. So what are we actually saying? Well, I guess we could draw as an analogy. If we were gathered in the United Nations building and all of the nations were assembled and we were communicating in English to them, they would not hear us in English. They would hear us in their individual languages. For example, if their representation from China or Japan, they would hear what we were saying in Chinese or Japanese. So. How does that equate here? Verse 7. Bear in mind, he's still talking about them being, them hearing them in their own languages. And they were amazed and astonished. Verse 7 we we're in, saying, Why? Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? They make reference to Galileans. The Galileans were individuals at this particular time were not very much respected. It was kind of like the shepherds in the field. When, when the angelic realm at the birth of the Christ came to the shepherds and the shepherds said what had transpired, their, their word wasn't, wasn't actually accepted until they had seen the birth of the Christ. So, are all of these not Galileans? <clears throat> Then it goes on to say, 
in verse 8. And how is it that we hear each, each of them in our own language? Language which we were born. Native languages. And then in, in uh, verse 10, it names, or verse 9 really, the, the, the nations that were, were there among them. Uh, Pantheans, Medes, Elamites, residents from uh, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phalagia, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around uh, Siren, Cyrene, <coughs> and visitors from Rome both Jews and proselytes. A proselyte is an individual that has adhered to Judaism. Uh, there were Christians and Arabs. We hear them in our own language speaking, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Now the whole communication here at this time was not the gospel. They were talking about, as it says, the mighty deeds of God. Now, you say, well, when did they get to the gospel? Or was it actually presented? Yes, it was. But <clears throat> you don't hear about that until we get from to verse 14 and go beyond that. Um, so, <clears throat> the latter part of that, with, with the mighty deeds of God in mind, we go down to verse 12. And they all continued to, to in, in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, others were mocking and scoffing and saying, they are full of sweet wine. In other words, they were saying that these individuals are doing all of this because they're drunk. Well, that was not the case. They were saying these things to communicate to the individuals in the room because of the indwelling and filling of the Holy Spirit. And Peter takes issue with that. Uh, before we move on any further, uh, between verses 14 and 22, does anybody have anything, questions or anything, that they want to touch on before we go on? Okay, let's pick it up at, uh, and bear in mind, like I said, prior to what we're about to get into, they were talking about the mighty deeds of, of God. Now, let's look at verse 14, starting at verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Israel, and all of you who are and, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day, which is nine o'clock in the morning. And then Peter goes on to say. But this is what was spoken to you through the prophet Joel. Now he's making reference to the prophecy of uh, Joel in chapter 2, second chapter of Joel. Um, verses... 28 to 32 of the second chapter of Joel. And this is what it reads. It says, It shall be in, in the last days, God says, that I will uh, pour forth <clears throat> of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men 
shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, <clears throat> both male, both men and women, I will in those days pour out uh, out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will grant wondrous. <clears throat> And I will grant wonders uh, in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of, of smoke. <clears throat> the sun will be turned into uh, darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come and it shall, it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved <clears throat> but Joel was actually prophesying a couple of things first of all he was prophesying things that would come to be and he was also prophesying the at the future days when the second coming will occur. That is, the, he was looking at a time, at the time in the latter days when Christ himself would return. So all of these things Peter was saying to them. And Peter was saying that because in his mind, he was thinking from the Old Testament. And the message that he was conveying to them, they should have been well aware of what had already transpired, what they were witnessing, uh, what they were witness to, the indwelling and the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So they should have been well aware of that. But he goes on to say in verse 22, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, of Na Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. So he's saying to them, this is what happened and you are witnesses to it because it transpired in your midst. You were there. Verse 23. He says, this man, and he's making reference to the Christ. He said, this man delivered over by a <clears throat> predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of, of godless men and put him to death. So he's actually, now he's talking about the divine plan for the Christ to go to the cross crucifixion. So he, he's still presenting these things to them. <clears throat> but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was uh, impossible for him to be held in its power. He's talking about the resurrection. He's also pointing out to the fact that the Christ was in the grave three days. No longer than that, but at that time he came out of the grave. So Peter's all pointing all of that to them. <clears throat> and he goes on to verse 25. He said, For David said to him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he, <clears throat> he is at my, my right hand so that I will never be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my, my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because 
You will not abandon my soul to she, to uh, Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay in the grave for three days, no more than that. Verse 28. You have made known to me <clears throat> the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness uh, with your presence. And then Peter picks it up again in verse 29. He says, brethren, which tells us right away that he's speaking to the Christians as well. Then there are Christians within that crowd. We already read where they were devout men. <clears throat> and of course, the apostles were there. He says, brethren, may I con uh, confidently say to you, Regarding the patriarch, David, that he, <clears throat> that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, David's tomb. Then he goes on in verse 30, and he says, And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one, one of his descendants, on his throne. So who's he talking about? He's talking about the Christ. Christ will occupy the throne of David. Well, when is that? During the millennial reign, 1,000 years. And I know that there are individuals that want to symbolize and say that the millennial reign is, is symbolic. It's not literal. It is literal. It is literally 1,000 <clears> a <throat> thousand years in which he will reign. <clears throat> we also know that those of us who are Christ-centered, born-again believers will reign with him. When is that going to happen? Well, we know it's not going to occur until the church has been raptured. Well, when is that going to happen? I'm not about to insult you by giving you a date. I don't know, you don't know, but we know this. Whenever it, occur, it occurs, uh, we'll be ready. And as of right now, it, it's imminent. It could occur right now while we're still gathered here. But if you're not ready to go when Christ comes for the church, you're already too late. So, <clears throat> we used to have a saying at the fire station uh, when I was involved in fire service many years ago. Uh, you can't prepare for an emergency. There's no such thing as getting ready for an emergency. When the emergency comes, you have to be ready to respond. So when the Christ comes for the church, you have to be ready to go. Okay. <clears throat> so we're talking about the Christ occupying the throne of David. Let's look at verse 31. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. <clears throat> that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did, he, did, his, did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus, God raised, <clears throat> raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Now, Peter is saying, you know that. We are all witnesses. He's speaking directly to the twelve, but he's also speaking to everybody else in the crowd. The twelve were witnesses, and all of them that were there with Peter. <clears throat> he says, therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured forth uh, this which you both see and heard. He is making reference to just what transpired in front of them. Uh, the indwelling and the, the, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Then he goes down to uh, verse 34. 
For it was not David uh, who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at the right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, whom you crucified. And that's what Peter is saying to them. Um, he is not holding back anything. He's just laying the truth out for them and to them. He is allowing them to go to the point of remembering what they saw and were eyewitnesses to. And he's also bringing them to the present and saying to them, this is what transpired and this is the reason for it. And you are witnesses to that because what you saw that just transpired in front of you, this is the reason why. So, <clears throat> I won't go any further than that this morning. Um, <laughs> as I said to Cheryl often enough, I'm not going to dump the truck. I'm just going to clear the tailgate. <laughs> but uh, I really wanted us to, to take this time in this study to really be aware of and understand what actually is transpiring. We as believers and an integral part of our salvation that we neither earn nor do we deserve, Christians don't realize, or more often than not, they, they may very well slough it off as it were. The body of Christ is the most unique group on the planet. And it's not because we either earn it nor, nor do we at the ascension, after the ascension. And, and right there between uh, Peter and the other apostles. So we are not only indwelled by the Holy Spirit, we are sealed. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. It means that we are sealed as believers in Christ. And all of these things are not things that we earn or deserve. It's not because of us. It's because of Christ. It's because of what he did on the cross. We are the beneficiaries of that. Um, I, I sadly say that, that uh, the majority of the body of Christ don't even know that. They, we are <clears throat> sanctified, which means to be set apart. Again, all of this is because of what Christ did. We are the recipients of so great salvation. Um, I can't tell you what's going to happen in the next five minutes. But I can tell you where we're going to be in the next 500 years. We will be in the presence of our God. And not because we earn it or we deserve it. It's because, as we said, because of what Christ did for us. And we are the recipients of, of uh, everything that he has done. We have accepted Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And everything that has transpired within the past few months... Uh, I hope has not been detrimental to the church, the body of Christ. Um, there are certain individuals that I'm sure they've had their, their faith shaken or rattled, as a case may be, that uh, they're, they're wondering why these things transpired. But we have to stay focused on the fact that no matter what happens in the world, we're in the world. We're not of the world. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And what we're seeing is <clears throat> absolute lawlessness, criminality. Um, and I, I do not hesitate to say that the, the, the basis or the root of this is definitely without a doubt satanic influence. There are things going on now uh, within the past few months that would never have been thought of 15 years ago. But that's how much the nation itself and the body has deteriorated to this point. And it also emphasizes the fact that 
apostasy and depravity uh, and the falling away. Uh, people question their faith. There are individuals who, who seek to want to uh, redefine, as it were, everything that God has ordained. Everything that God has ordained. You can't change what, <coughs> what God has ordained. Because <clears throat> these are things that are, are divinely divinely initiated. You, you have to remember, as, as we talked about uh, the Gospel of John, uh, the first uh, earthly ministry that the Christ performed was a wedding. A wedding in Cana of Galilee. And there are those individuals who would like nothing more than to redefine marriage. Sorry, not going to happen. But anyway, these are the things that are out there, as it were. But, uh, as I said, I think we've covered what we need to cover this morning. So, uh, if, if anyone or no one has any questions or anything, why will we'll go ahead and close with prayer. Anybody? Don't everybody say, I do, I do at the same time. <laughs> Let's bow for prayer. Father, we do thank you for the privilege of looking into your inerrant word. We thank you for all the blessings, the provisions, the grace and the mercy that you poured out on us. These are things that we neither earn nor do we deserve. But again, we ask that this portion of your word, your word, might be a source of challenge and blessing for us. Enable us, Father, we ask to continue to grow in grace and in the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together said, Amen. Amen.